Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Freilich, consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome to Nerve Puzzle number seven. This case, as with all other cases, is purely hypothetical and any resemblance to any individual is purely coincidental. Let's start with the first case now. We have a 52-year-old gentleman who's a right-handed accountant. There is a four-month history of tripping on curbs with weakness in the left leg and numbness over the left foot. There was an acute episode of back pain preceding all of it and symptoms are present all of the time. There is no obvious wasting in the leg, however tone is mildly reduced when moving the left ankle. Power was reduced 4 plus out of 5 on dorsiflexion and ankle inversion too. Sensation was reduced to pinprick on the lateral leg and the dorsum of the foot. Let's consider the differential diagnosis here. Could this be an individual nerve lesion? Well, if we think about the perineal nerve, we've got weakness of ankle dorsiflexion and we have got numbness on the top of the foot. However, we also have some tibial nerve fiber involvement as well with weakness of ankle inversion and also numbness on the side of the foot too. Could this be a combination of the two? Well, yes, I suppose that is possible. Um, it would be difficult to explain in this particular context. Could this be a higher up nerve lesion? Well, could it be a sciatic nerve lesion? Again, it would be difficult to explain in the context of this particular presentation. However, that's not out of the question uh, when you think about it in broader terms. Could this be a plexus uh, problem at the lumbosacral plexus? Well, I suppose it could be. And could it be radiculopathy? Yes, it could be as well. The most important thing from the clinical perspective is the fact that there is back pain here. And so therefore, on the clinical terms, the most likely uh, cause of all of this will be a radiculopathy at L5-S1 level. Let's delve into the nerve conduction data. So straight away, let's have a look at the sensory nerve action potentials. We can see on the left side, the sural nerve has an amplitude of 25 microvolts, the superficial perineal nerve has got an amplitude of 14 microvolts and these are very normal and in fact when we compare to the other side they're very symmetrical so we can immediately tell we are not dealing with a postganglionic process we're dealing with a preganglionic process and we really need to be thinking about radiculopathy from the very get-go of this study let's have a look at the motor action potentials let's concentrate on the left side we've got a normal distal motor latency we've got normal conduction in the lower leg and across the fibular neck. So 47 meters per second and it speeds up to 53 meters per second across the fibular neck. So there's no compression of the perineal nerve across the fibular neck. We've got reduced and asymmetric motor amplitudes here. So we've got 0.5 millivolts versus 5.6 on the other side. We've also got a prolonged F latency, 56 milliseconds versus 46 on the other side. When we look at the posterior tibial nerve at the abductor hallucis, we can see again there's a reduction in the motor amplitude on the left side, 3.6 versus 15.3. And again, the F latency is prolonged. So all of these things are pointing towards a proximal lesion. Let's have a look at the EMG, normal vastus medialis on the left. However, we have got denervation of the tibialis anterior and the gastrocnemius here. So all of these things together point towards this being a radiculopathy at the L5-S1 level. So in conclusion, we can say that there is a moderate and active left L5-S1 motor radiculopathy. Let's consider a number of clinical points here. The first one is whenever I have a patient who comes into my clinic complaining of numbness in the feet, I always ask as a first question, is it the same in both legs or is it different? Is one side affected more than the other? If it's a symmetrical process, we're most likely to be dealing with a neuropathy. If it's asymmetric, on the balance of probabilities, we are most likely to be dealing with a radiculopathy. And then the next question is, is there any history of back pain? And almost certainly you'll find that this is going to be the actual cause. The next clinical point, I'd just like to make is when we check ankle inversion it's really important that you put the ankle into a neutral position otherwise the muscle tibias posterior is at a disadvantage when the ankles flopped downwards and it will be weak and this will be a false result. There's another concept to 
get to grips with, which is the difference between radicular pain and radiculopathy. Radicular pain is pain in a dermatomal distribution, however there's no numbness, there's no weakness, and there is no loss of reflexes. Radiculopathy, by contrast, will involve numbness, weakness, and loss of reflexes in the associated uh, dermatome and myotome. The final point I'd just like to remind viewers is that when it comes to radiculopathy, there are microscopic causes and macroscopic causes. You can see more details about these in my videos related to this by clicking on the iCard above. Just a couple of neurophysiological points. Pre- and post-ganglionic processes. If it's a pre-ganglionic process, the sensory nerve action potentials will not be affected. If it's a post-ganglionic process, then the sensory nerve action potentials will be affected. And that's how you can differentiate between a radiculopathy and the lumbosacral plexopathies, the sciatic nerve lesions, etc. Um, the next point I'd like to make is that the superficial perineal sensory nerve action potential can be a little bit of an exception to this rule because of where its sensory ganglion is sitting in relation to the foramina and where it might be getting a little bit compressed within the process of a radiculopathy. So sometimes you can see a mild reduction in the sensory nerve action potential of the superficial perineal nerve in a L5 radiculopathy. However, it should never be absent. And if it is truly absent, then you've got to be thinking about other processes. Now, I've had a couple of experiences where I've had patients who have had a very clear history of a back problem. And on the first pass, I haven't found a sensory nerve action potential for the superficial perineal nerve. And you start wondering, well, am I missing something? Is this a plexopathy or, or static nerve lesion or what? And invariably what I have found is you just need to go back and check it again. Make sure that you've prepped the skin properly. Use perhaps a mild abrasive, for example, new prep, and just clean the skin down. Perhaps use some alcohol, a stiletto wipe, or some soapy water, just to clean down any residue on the skin. If there's any greases or oils, again, really important to try and get rid of those. And if you do this again, make sure you use supramaxial stimulation. I can almost guarantee you every single time, it's always worked for me, that that superficial perineal snap will appear and that's so critical in our decision making when we're considering pre and post ganglionic processes so those are just a couple of uh, hints and tips as to what to do in that scenario so i'd just like to thank you for watching this video i hope you found it useful please do support this channel by liking sharing and subscribing it's really important it really helps the seo for this channel i hope to see you all in the next video thank you very much